Today we're going to talk about storytelling and case building. We, these are very important skills to have as you go through your career at Georgia Tech and um, after Georgia Tech as well. So we take the perspective of how to effectively tell your story or position your case while considering the customer or the end user or stakeholder as a key component of the story that you're telling. You guys can use this recorded lecture um, as a guide and for some tips on how to effectively build your final presentation for this class. So when we talk about storytelling, we're trying to get you guys to think about effectively communicating your lessons learned. And that could be your lessons learned of the methodology of the class, um, your lessons learned throughout the group project, or your lessons learned of the specific problem space and customer that you've spent time getting to know. So oftentimes when we think of presentations, we think of somebody in front of a room, um, you know, kind of dragging on on a particular topic, and oftentimes we lose the audience. It tends to be a bit boring. So why, why are presentations so terrible? Why do most presentations that we receive uh, tend to drag on and be a little bit boring? Why are they so boring? Um, you know, why we kind of lean into being so boring when we're giving presentations. Um, and an answer for that is that we've been, many of us have been trained to give presentations in a particular way. So we've all been trained in a very homogenous way about how to deliver our position or our, or our case um, or our particular solution or our piece of information. And a lot of it revolves around this idea that we need to be presenting a lot of facts, that we need to be presenting a lot of data to back up our position and our argument. Um, you know, many of us, when we are tasked with writing a research paper or delivering a presentation on a particular topic, we tend to immediately go to Google and start searching that topic and seeking out statistics, seeking out graphs and charts um, and anything that can demonstrate that this is, in fact, a large um, problem that needs to be solved or a large uh, thing that needs to be addressed. And we do that all through data and facts, which can get incredibly dull, right? It can get very difficult for the audience to connect and to want to continue to pay attention when all you're doing is presenting them with graphs and charts. But really, what is the point of building a good case? What is the point of storytelling? It This is the point, right? It, the point is to not only provide the data and facts, but to provide strong visual cues that excite the audience, that allow the audience to connect to what it is you're trying to communicate, and that gives an audience a point of, um, you know, a point of interest in the narration of your case. So when you're building a case for change, you cannot survive on data and facts alone. You also have to tap into emotions. When you're telling a good story, you're using data to back up your position, but you're also tapping into emotions to capture the attention of your audience and to keep them attentive on what it is you're trying to communicate. If you've ever had a chance to watch um, a TEDx, a TED uh, talk or a TEDx talk, you'll notice that most of those presenters will oftentimes talk about their topic through the lens of, of a particular story, of a particular character or user themselves. Um, and that is done purposefully to try to get the audience to connect to the topic at hand. So, you know, when we think about the power of telling stories, we, we start at a very young age getting told stories. We start at a very young age um, with our parents um, kind of being told about particular adventures and it's a way for us even at a young age to begin to learn and understand the environment around us the way that people interact just basically everything it's an excellent way for young children to learn and that doesn't change as we get older so the power of telling stories is the power of building empathy you're able to build empathy and understanding across the human condition um, you're able to begin to connect to what other people might be going through by relating it back to your own emotion and your own experience. Um, and you can't just do that with data and facts. So why? Why is this true? It is literally how we are wired in our brains. 
So by con by communicating via emotion and via storytelling, we actually release dopamine in the brain. And if you're talking via data and facts alone, frankly, your brain is asleep. It is not, it's not um, as connected to what's being communicated. When you add emotions, you're 22 times more likely to remember the facts that are woven into a narrative. So when you add emotion and you add storytelling, um, to your presentation, your audience is 22 times more likely to remember the position that you're trying to present, the facts that you're trying to present. And this is what you'll see with a lot of startups in innovation. The cases that get built, the pitches that get built, tend to be very heavy in storytelling because they want to capture the attention of the investors, they want to capture the attention of the audience, so everybody can understand that the problem that they're solving with their solution or their startup is in fact important. And the best way for them to do that is by weaving their facts regarding that problem through the narrative of the customer. So truthfully, it's that stories resonate with us, right? They stick with us. They help us to form memories. They help us to retain facts. They um, <clears throat> activate an emotional region of the brain. Uh, that allows us to actually connect it to our personal experience and then store that particular story as a memory and, and to store any facts related in that story into our brain as a memory. Stories also help us connect with one another. They sync our thinking, so it allows you to get your audience on the same page with you. You can essentially sync the listener, the audience, um, by activating the same part of the brain. Um, by doing so, you're able to more effectively um, connect with them, communicate with them, and, and potentially win them over onto why your problem is an important thing and why your solution is the right solution. So typically, you know, when you think about information transfer, even this lecture, for example, you know, I'm talking, 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 you guys are listening, and there's um, some information that's being transferred, but not all of it. The vast majority of what I'm going to say to you will, um, not the vast majority, but I should say a portion of what I'm going to say to you will in fact, you know, go in one ear and out the other. Um, and oftentimes you'll see with Melissa and I and the way that we lecture, we, re we repeat concepts throughout our lectures. And that's on purpose because you only a small portion of what you're hearing is actually um, coming in and, and sticking with you. However, if we add in elements of storytelling and we add in, um, you know, whether it's an actual story or whether it's elements of storytelling like strong visuals, um, like relating it to a particular metaphor or a particular person that we can all relate to, the shared conceptual space actually expands. Uh, so we actually have a stronger information transfer to you. You know, storytelling is also important. We can see it's, it's validated that it's important. We as a culture, as a society, as humanity, really, uh, strongly value stories and storytellers. We can see that by how much we pay our key storytellers, our actors and our actresses. Those are our storytellers, our writers. You know, when we see how much they get paid to actually convey and communicate stories of the human condition to help us relate and understand our environments and our culture, we can definitely understand why humanity, that humanity, in fact, values stories. And this has been true for, for the duration of human history. We, it, storytelling has always been a component of that, from cave drawings all the way up um, to the movies that we see today. It's also a part of everybody's, you know, everybody is ingrained with this inherent desire to tell stories. Um, and we can see that through the explosion of social media. So now not only do we value, highly value our celebrities for being our great storytellers of our societies, but we also can see that through the high activity on social media. Everybody who can, can get their hands on a social media platform and, you know, once that platform is now expressing their story, their life, their experience, their perspective through these platforms. And you can just see just by the, the sheer numbers of people that are interacting and whether it's Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, there's this, these are platforms that allow the individual to become the storyteller of their own life um, out to the world. And it, it's an incredible 
it's an incredible transformation for human history in, in terms of storytelling because we all now have a megaphone, basically. We all now have a voice and an ability to tell our own stories out to the world. So you can think of stories. Stories are also, they can be the light, right? They can illuminate um, circumstances. They can um, bring um, relevance to huge events that are taking place or small events that take place can, can kind of rise up and help with huge tr culturally transformative movements. Um, you know, I'm going to give you an old example here in just a second, uh, but just, just to give you kind of context, if you want to think about it in, in terms of current events, you know, we could show you, um, we could show you all sorts of statistics about <clears throat> about police brutality, for example, in the United States. But it it's sort of the the tipping point this year for everything that's been going on was because of an individual and the individual story that was told, and that was George Floyd, and that became the spark that lit off a path a pathway towards change. And so it wasn't facts and data and graphs, but rather it was an individual and the storytelling behind that individual and what took place. You'll find, like, even if you think about, for example, the coronavirus pandemic, you know, we're all looking at the statistics on a regular basis, but it's not until someone can talk about it. You know, I see a lot of people who have a hard time understanding the, um, I want to say the severity of this pandemic until they have a, an individual person they can connect to um, the impacts of this virus. So again, it takes an, a, a connection to an individual story or narrative to really help you see the pathway to change or to help you see the problem at hand. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick example. Um, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin which was a firsthand uh, narrative of basically the slave experience. And when Abraham Lincoln um, met her, he basically told her, so you're the, you're the woman that wrote the book that made this great war. And the reason, you know, he said that is because the story that she told, um, it was published in 1854. It outsold the that year's Bible sales, which back then was a huge deal. It's often called the first bestseller. And it was an emotional and firsthand experience and portrayal of the cruelty of slavery in the United States. And it roused a huge shift in abolitionist support, which eventually led to the Civil War. Um, so, you know, it's it's important to keep in mind that stories have the have the ability to effectively change society and change culture and on a much smaller scale they have the ability to change the understanding perspective in the minds of your audience um, so whether you're pitching a startup idea or whether you're presenting your research or whether you're trying to build a case for change doing so through the lens of individual humans and individual experiences can move your mission along much faster than going through the the dry um, kind of homogenous what we've been told to present which is the facts and the data and the graphs and the charts if you can bring it down to a human level and talk through it through a narrative you will find it it's much more effect a much more effective way to carry your facts and carry your position so stories are also uh, storytelling is a glue it's a glue for building community and building empathy and coherence across a large number of people. Um, you know, we, we, like I said before, we've been told stories for most of our lives from childhood. And it, it's basically, it's less about how you think about something and more about how you feel about something. Right. And if you can, if you can connect how you feel about something um, on emotional level, then you're you're able to more strongly connect. So they also stories also allow us to simplify facts, right? It's a, if you can tell it through a narrative, you can get to the point faster. Always like to include this slide <laughs> because I'm using PowerPoint right now, but <laughs> there's like good ways and bad ways to use PowerPoint, and you know many many people have been trained in all the bad arts of PowerPoint. 
Um, and I'm going to show you some examples of what that might look like in just a second. Um, so when you are using tools like PowerPoint and other tools, try to remember that it's a tool. It's a tool to be manipulated to suit your needs. It does not have to be, um, you know, I try to help people to understand that PowerPoint can be used as a presentation tool. Uh, to communicate a story or to communicate an effective presentation. It can also be used as a report building tool. So you can get a lot of facts and information on there, but think of it as something that like, like almost like a book, like a printed report. But when you switch gears between treating it like a presentation tool or treating it like a report tool, you have to be really understanding of what it is you're trying to create and for whom um, and then you have to be very careful not to kind of blend those two things. If you're giving a presentation that you want to be impactful, then you go with fewer words on the slides and more visuals um, because most of your story should be told verbally. If it's that you're trying to get all of the information out there about your particular project, then turn it into a reporting tool. But don't share that version of your presentation as a presentation, share that version as an appendix, share it as a reported document, you know, turn it into a PDF and say this is meant to be printed and read. Um, so know your audience and know your delivery. Uh, know whether or not it's in fact going to be a, a presentation or you can actually share it for somebody to read to get more information. So here is an example of the type of slide a type of slide that I might often see from various teams from Georgia Tech when they're first trying to understand how to be um, how to drive innovation and entrepreneurship, um, and I'm giving this example of e-scooters here, um, <clears throat> kind of trying to understand the rise and fall of e-scooters and the safety components around e-scooters and how there was no kind of regulation when they first hit the streets. Here in Atlanta, it was I mean it was basically like every corner you found like five or six different types of e-scooters and there was like 20 piled on top of each other. A lot of that has been scaled back pretty significantly as the city kind of reacted. But the point is this slide is like, it's like if somebody went on Google, Google searched this problem, which is exactly what I did to create the slide, and dropped in the first three graphs or charts trying to demonstrate facts. The graphs and charts are like, you know, not 100% connected. Um, it's a lot of information on one slide. There's some, you know, very verbose bullet points up here in the top left corner trying to articulate the position. And it's a lot. It's a lot for the audience to take in. You shouldn't treat a presentation slide like a place to try to get every single piece of information to your audience. That's not the point of a presentation. The point of a presentation is to get the most important parts um, of the information to your audience so that your audience becomes swayed and understands your position. So keep in mind a presentation is a visual story. It is a way, it is a mechanism for storytelling um, and it should be highly visual and low on text. You know, a picture of a problem is worth a thousand words. So here's an example of a grocery shopping list and it's messy and it's handwritten. It's on a ripped piece of paper um, and there's these little like coded things next to it that the, that the um, person obviously has some sort of coding system um, for how they go through the grocery store. And then here's the app solution, um, which kind of cleans up the list, makes it more legible. Um, you know, puts it into uh, a format in a way that you can quickly check it off as you go through the store versus trying to take a pen or something with you in the, in the grocery shopping cart and scratching it off. So this is an example of how to keep something highly visual to articulate the problem without having to communicate any facts whatsoever. So we could take a slide like this um, and then we could quickly move it over to a picture and a quote. So let's say in this example, you know, along with the secondary research on Google that I did to get all those facts, I also went out and interviewed people. And I took a picture of this guy, one of the guys that I interviewed, um, and I kind of, we pretended like he just fell, right, to kind of get the idea across, and captured one of his quotes from the interview. So this starts to communicate from a user's perspective what's really going on with e-scooters and how people truly feel about it. And so now I can tell the narrative of this, this particular person, right? I can say, 
This is Charlie. We talked to Charlie when we were trying to better understand the benefits and pitfalls of e-scooters as a green alternative to urban mobility. Charlie started using e-scooters last year when they arrived in Atlanta and has been using it every day from to and from work. He loves the convenience, the inexpensiveness, the green alternative. Charlie hurt himself, though, um, when he chose to ride on the sidewalk in a busy part of the city. The street did not have bike lanes, and the sidewalk had not been well maintained. Charlie fell and badly injured his knee and had to go to the emergency room. Um, he still uses e-scooters, but brings his own helmet and stays off the sidewalks. Um, some first-time users are not so, as lucky as Charlie. And I might continue to tell the story and, and relay some facts about the dangers of e-scooters and the lack of infrastructure. Um, and I might try to get across my point that although they have high, some benefits, they also have a lot of um, room to be improved. So as you can see, by telling a story, I'm able to more effectively communicate what's going on with this particular um, space, which is e-scooters. So the other thing, so as I mentioned, I was able to kind of simplify that, that slide with all the graphs to a story. And the whole idea of simplification is, um, and this goes back to the information transfer as well, um, basically your brain, you know, Harry Hachibu is a, is a, a concept in Japanese culture to eat until you're 80% full um, because you don't want to overfill yourself. You don't want to be overstuffed. And the same thing goes for your brain and your mind. Basically, every word that is unnecessary or every word that doesn't have um, a very clear and concise purpose as a part of your presentation or part of your argument just kind of pours over the side of a brimming mind. So everybody has a lot going on. They've got a lot in their brains, and the same is true of your audiences. And so you need to keep that in mind and give them, um, give them enough, but don't give them too much. Because if you give them enough, you might give them enough so that they then want to come ask you questions or they then want more information from you. And that's how you start, especially as an entrepreneur or an innovator, that's how you start to network and you start to get people to come on board to your position when they come up to you and say, that was really intriguing and I'd love to know more. But if you try to cram everything you possibly can into your position and your presentation, um, it's going to flow over the side of people's minds and they're going to become bored and stop paying attention. So here's another great, <laughs> you know, example, you know, we could over decorate, right? Over decorate our tree and it just becomes cumbersome and hard to look at. Um, or we can just keep it simple, right? Keep it simple and let its own sort of message and elegance shine through. Um, by doing so, we can amplify the essence of what's really there. You know, you want to create, when you're telling these stories, <clears throat> or giving these presentations rather, you want to create messages that really stick, that really stick with others. You want to use stories to do that, because stories, again, they convey emotion. And when you're conveying this emotion, you also want to try to weave in the unexpected. You want to weave in elements of surprise, things that will catch your audience off guard, um, or surprise them in some way, something they hadn't thought about, because that'll cause them to want to pay attention. And I'm not saying to eliminate facts. You do want to keep weaving your facts into your narrative to make it more concrete. And you want to make sure that those facts are, in fact, from credible sources. So you want to make sure there's an element of credibility uh, about your um, position as well. So as a reminder, Stories are a combination of data and emotion, okay? So you get to decide what data am I going to use? What emotion, what stories am I going to pull from, um, you know, particularly from my customer discovery interviews? And then how am I going to weave those things together? You can also think of it as storytelling being a bit of science and a bit of art. There's going to be some quote unquote black and white elements and there's going to be some gray areas um, and you want to use a combination of those two things to tell a really compelling story. Here are some typical story elements for you to keep in mind. There's typically a protagonist and antagonist. There's some sort of motivation. Oftentimes there's a conflict. Um, there's some sort of mission at hand or plot imperative. There's the actual 
style in which the narrative is told. Um, there's the environment or the setting of the story. Um, and then there's the kind of the tone voice in which it's presented. For you, you know, you've got the customer. The customer is a great main character for you to consider. Um, you could also consider um, kind of the antagonist as any other solutions that they're currently engaged with or any other current state that's happening that's not really resolving their issue. Or you consider the conflict as the problem, the jobs, the, you know, pain that is happening, the, the opportunity for gain, all those sorts of things. Um, the conflict may also be the misunderstanding of the customer. You know, ultimately, or the pot, plot imperative could be um, the value that you hope to deliver, the, the what you hope to solve. Um, you've kind of got this uh, journey that the customer is going through as they're getting their jobs done. And you've got, um, which tends to be the actual narrative, and then you've got the customer ecosystem, like where does this customer live, work, breathe, play, you know, who's around them and how do they influence them. So trying to get that environment piece. And then finally, you've got the culture and the voice of the customer as really kind of the voice of the story. It's also something to note is that how a story is told. Most stories kind of follow a very similar arc. And you guys can use this arc, especially as you're first getting comfortable with this idea of storytelling. Um, instead of just presenting. And the arc is really simple, right? You go through these peaks and valleys throughout throughout the story. There's various conflicts. There's the opening scene and there's like some character development and scene setting and environment setting. And then there might be an immediate conflict to grab your attention and then a dip in conflict. <clears throat> and then it kind of goes through that process until you get to some climactic event uh, that really kind of helps culminate the story and then at the end there's often um, you know a trailing part of the story that kind of closes things up or helps you kind of come to a conclusion. Another thing to potentially consider is what would Steve Jobs do when pitching a new product, right? A, a catchy headline, a villain, that would be the problem, right? A simple slide just showcasing the the you know value that could be delivered and then a quick demo of the actual product or the service um, and then like a holy smokes like eye-catching moment and that holy smokes moment could be somewhere in the middle but something that like really makes you think oh we need this I need this that's something I need so again story data facts and emotion quotes or notes from your customer interviews what is the story you guys are hoping to tell and how will the conversations you had with your customers help you tell that story so I'm going to share with you a little exercise um, and I would encourage you guys to um, maybe give this a go on your own. You can take you know, a screenshot from this video file um, and try to replicate it. But basically anyone can tell a story and if you wanted to use this sort of Mad Lib exercise, it really kind of um, gives you a, a way to set it up. Okay, so we're going to walk through this exercise and you guys can give this exercise a try for your own solutions as a way to kind of tell a story or start to craft a narrative for your presentation. So what you need, a customer segment, the job they're trying to get done, compelling options or inferior, I'm sorry, competing options or inferior solutions, pains that each of these options present, your team's solution, and then pain or gain creators that the solution provides. Um, and those pain or gain creators could be functional, um, they could be emotional, or they could be social. Um, there's a whole lot of needs that you're trying to answer for this customer segment. And then finally, your team's ultimate vision or goal. So we're, so we're going to do this through um, the perspective of Uber, right? We've got Jonah, a young urban professional. I would say for your customer... You don't necessarily have to say the name of somebody you actually interviewed, but you could do a fake customer that is representative. So Jonah is a young urban professional. He's looking for reliable, fast ground transportation. His options today, or today being 10 years ago, are a car, a taxi, or a subway. Let's say he lives in New York. So the car is stressful, it's high cost, and it's hard to maintain, right? So those, you know, especially in the city, it's very high cost to park and store a vehicle. You also have a lot of traffic, right? A taxi is similarly stressful because you're going to sit in traffic. 
it's unreliable you're not sure if you're actually going to find one and it can feel expensive you know while the subway or public transportation is less expensive it's also inefficient it's not taking you directly from point a to point b can be slow can also be very crowded which these days um you know is not something you want to deal with so the solution that's being presented is uber so what does it do from a functional perspective it's more reliable it's easier to use it's less expensive um, emotionally you can actually see the arrival time you get the driver's rating and the cost so ahead of time so all those things are confidence builders make you feel more secure with this solution socially you can start to tell friends about this great new idea um, and you can interact with the uber driver there's a lot of it uh, fulfilling social needs as well and so the team's ultimate vision or goal is to be the largest ground transportation on the planet so if you wanted to take this exercise a step further, you could use this Mad Libs template um, for your own solution and problem space as a way to do this, and then maybe leverage this narrative um, as a way to set up your presentation, organize your presentation. So here's the story, right? Once there was a young urban professional named Jonah who needed reliable, fast ground transportation. Jonah tried owning a car, but it was too stressful, too high cost, and high maintenance. Jonah tried taking a taxi, but it was too stressful. It was unreliable and still expensive. Jonah tried taking the subway, but it was too crowded. It was slow and it was inefficient. One day, Jonah's friend Tori told him about Uber, and he got his first ride for free. Because Uber was more reliable, easier to use, and less expensive, it fulfilled Jonah's functional needs by doing the job better than any of his alternatives. Because Jonah could see when the car would arrive, the driver's rating, and the price before he paid for his ride, it relieved his emotional anxiety about taxi cabs. Because it was easy to refer friends, Jonah gained social status, increasing his personal brand equity with every share. Because Uber focuses on the job to be done, pains and gains of Jonah and other people like him, they were able to create a solution that fit just right. Until finally, Uber became the largest ground transportation service on the planet. So obviously you might need to make some tweaks to this, but this kind of gives you a little bit of a template that you could potentially um, jump off from to uh, craft your narrative for your problem and solution. Anyway, I hope that this lecture was helpful in the way that you think about presenting information and specifically the way that you think about presenting, doing your final presentation for this class. Uh, remember, you want to keep it about the customer and about their journey through the problem and how your solution is going to provide value for them. I don't want to hear too much about your solution's technical capabilities or features, but rather what is the value that your solution is providing and how is it improving that customer's um, problem or pain that they're experiencing currently. So you should be telling the story from that perspective. Keep it visual. Keep it simple. Try to craft in a narrative that has um, some conflict and some resolution uh, to really capture your audience's attention. Hope this was helpful. Um, see you in class.